Hare Krishna. Hare Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Okay, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. 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 My what? Your video is off. You want to see me? You need to see me? Yes, oh, my right. I don't know how to switch it on. Oh. It's the second option from the down. On my handphone, I don't see how to do it. It's okay, my heart. No problem. Okay. I haven't figured out how to use all these things. Anyway, we'll begin. Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chatsur Militanina Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Avanchata upata rubyascha kripa sindhu bhai evacha patita nam pavane pyo vaishnavibhyo namo namaha. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadatha Shri Vasadhi Gurbhavana Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Hare. Okay, we're on mantra number eight. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, Mama. Yes, Mama. Hey, Chris. Can you hear me? Recording in progress. Yes, Mama. Yes, Mama. Yes, Maharaj, we can hear you. Yeah, you, you can. You can. Uh, are you, are, are are you hearing me? I can't hear you. Uh, your voice, Maharaj, was breaking. I'm sorry, I don't hear you, Marichi Prabhu. I can see you. I don't oh. hear what you're saying. We cannot. You must. Cannot hear you, Maharaj. Uh, no, no, you cannot hear us. Maybe you have to turn your. <laughs> uh, how? How? How will Maharaj listen? He cannot listen now, us. Now we can see your video and maybe you can. Yeah, I can see you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes. Maharaj. Okay, then I'll you. just continue. I don't, I can't hear you, but uh, 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 I'll 
begin. Okay, mantra eight. Saparya jak shukramai parnam ashnaviram shudam apapa vidam kabir mani si parambur swayambur yatayatol pratan padadat such a person must factually know the greatest of all, the personality of Godhead, who is unembodied, omniscient, beyond reproach, without veins, pure and uncontaminated. The self-sufficient philosopher who has been fulfilling everyone's desire since time immemorial. So we had we had the invocation mantra describing the Supreme Lord as Purnam. And then we had the first three mantras about proprietorship how everybody everything is the property of the lord and how we should take only what is our proper quota and then what happens to people if you take your quota if you just take your quota you get a long life and if you take more than what you're actually entitled to then you suffer the reactions for that, the consequences. So that's the first three mantras. Then mantra four and five were describing the Supreme Lord. And we heard about the Lord's potencies, how he surpasses all in excellence, and the powerful demigods cannot approach him and we heard how he has inconceivable qualities. You'll remember we spoke how he walks and he does not walk. And he's far away and he's near as well. Like that. This is the Ish Ishopanish, a typical Ishopanishad description of the Lord. Now, we can notice also We've never mentioned any particular name of the Lord. Although you could say in the invocation mantra, Om was there. Om was described by Srila Prabhupada as the complete whole. But there's no particular name. We don't hear Vishnu or Krishna or Shiva or anything. Just descriptions. So this is a this is the Ishopanishad. The Upanishads are like this, that they, they're stepping stones to the absolute truth. Now they reveal the absolute truth in a more indirect manner. So then mantra, uh, mantra eight, oh, oh, oh we, well, we heard like mantra six and seven, was about the Mahabhagava devotees, right? After hearing about the Supreme Lord, on the previous class, we spoke about the, the, the different devotees and how there, is, there are great souls, uh, Uttama Adhikaris, who see everything equal, everyone equally. So, so like that, that the, the, the Lord, uh, the devotees are described. Now we're coming back to Mantra 8, and we're going to, we're hearing again this, a description about the Lord, about the absolute nature of the Lord, about his transcendental form, you could say, right? That he's described here that he is unembodied unembodied so we would think oh it means he doesn't have a body but of course he has a body but not a material body and he is omniscient 
He knows everything because he's everywhere. All right. Beyond reproach means he can do anything. Nobody can uh, chastise him. You cannot complain about it. He has the right to do whatever he likes. He's without veins. So we wonder what kind of body is this? Well, he's unembodied, so without veins, pure and uncontaminated. So this this is the transcendental nature of the, the Lord. And then the verse continues, he's the, the self-sufficient philosopher who has been fulfilling everyone's desire since time immemorial. So that's an important point to note, that the Lord is fulfilling our desires since time immemorial. And in other words, we get what we deserve according to our qualification to receive. The Lord reciprocates with us. So we'll go through Prabhupada's purport to this very instructive verse here. Here is a description of the transcendental and eternal form of the absolute personality of Godhead. The Supreme Lord is not formless. He has his own transcendental form, which is not at all similar to the forms of the mundane world. The form of the living entities in this world are embodied in material nature and they work like any material machine. The anatomy of a material body must have a mechanical construction with veins and so forth. But the transcendental body of the Supreme Lord has nothing like veins. It is clearly stated here that he is unembodied, which means that there is no difference between his body and his soul. He is not forced to accept a body according to the laws of nature as we are. In material conditional life, the soul is different from the gross embodiment and subtle mind. For the Supreme Lord, however, there is never any such difference between him and his body and mind. He is the complete whole and his mind, body and he himself are all one and the same. So, <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada is explaining to us here the meaning of this term, un unembodied. Right? As it's mentioned in the verse. Uh, akayam. Akayam, Avirnam. Akayam meaning the unembodied. Hmm. So Prabhupada explains there's no difference between the, the Lord's body and his soul. His body is spiritual. We have a material body. And with the material body, there's mechanical, Prabhupada describes it as mechanical construction with which to uh, maintain the soul. And within that construction, there are veins and the structure of the bones. And then you have different organs also. But for Lord Krishna, he has a transcendental body. 
his body is not material. So he has a body which is made of spirit. Without veins, without uh, all the flesh and the, the blood and the, all the horrible things which are there within the body, which go together to make the body function. The Lord simply has a spiritual body. And he comes. Uh, uh, okay. So the, the Lord has a transcendental body. He's not forced to accept a body as we were. We're conditioned, we're forced by the laws of nature. So we take our birth and we take a body. It's all by our karma. But for the Lord, there's no karma. The Lord is the controller of karma. Right? So, so the, the, we can never, we, we have to understand this, this important principle. And by understanding these principles, then we will be able to better understand Lord Krishna's transcendental position. Just like in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna explains that if we understand how his birth and activities are all transcendental, then you never have to take birth again. So the same point, it, it's, it's, it, 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 we're given this uh, guidance here by the Upanishads to understand how the Lord has a transcendental body, how his body and his mind are not different from him difference between him and his body and mine he is a cool and his body and he himself are in this we are not on the mind for the Supreme Lord. There's no difference between his body, his mind, and his soul. All right. We'll continue here. In the Brahma Samhita, there is a similar description of the Supreme Lord. He is described there as such a Ananda Vigraha, which means that he is the eternal form, fully represents knowledge and bliss. As such, he does not require a separate body or mind, as we do in material existence. The Vedic literature little body is completely different from ours. Ours is sometimes described, oh, he is sometimes described as formless. This means that he has no form like ours and that he is devoid of form. We can conceive of Mm. This means that he has no form like ours and that he is devoid of form as we can conceive of. So he's devoid of any form which we like to understand with our limited mind and senses, then that is not going to is not going to reach to the limits of the form of the Lord. The Lord's form is beyond our own understanding. We have to understand that his form is transcendental. And that means it's beyond uh, the understanding of our material mind and senses. We want to understand the form of the Lord. The process to understand the form of the Lord is by hearing about him. 
We have to hear about him from the scriptures. And the Ishopanishad here is guiding us, helping us to understand how the Lord has a transcendental form. At the same time, he is described here, they use the word for, formless. Sometimes the Lord is described in this way, that formless meaning he has no material form. It has no form like our material form. But it does not mean he is without form on the spiritual platform. All right, so we'll continue here. Uh, in the Brahma Samhita, it is further stated that with each and every part of his body, he can do the work of the other senses. This means that the Lord can walk with his hands. He can accept things with his legs. He can see with his hands and feet. He can eat with his eyes, etc. In the, in the Shruti mantras, it is also said that although the Lord has no hands and legs like ours, he has a different type of hands and legs by which he can accept all that we can offer him and run after and run faster than anyone. These points are confirmed in this eighth mantra through the use of words like uh, sukram, meaning on omnipotent. All right, so uh, we want to understand some things here. First of all, the transcendental nature of the Lord's body is described that he can do anything with any one of his senses. Of course, we sing about this every morning when we offer the Govinda prayers. Angani yasya shakalendriya vriti manti pashyanti panti pashyanti panti kalayanti charam jaganti ananda chinmaya sadujwala vigrahasya Govinda mahadipursam tamaham bhajami that I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who, uh, who's, uh, whose transcendental body is full of truth, bliss, and substantiality, and is thus full of the most dazzling splendor. Each of the limbs of his transcendental body possess within themselves the full flesh functions of all the organs. So each of the limbs of the body of the Lord possess the functions of all the organs. So any sense can do any other thing. And Prabhupada describes, he can see with his eyes, he can eat with his hands, that eat with his eyes, he can move with his, he can move without his legs, He's not dependent on the material senses. The point is that the Lord's body is not like our body, but he has a fully transcendental body. And Prabhupada quotes Shruti mantras. It Prabhupada said in the Shruti mantras. Now when Prabhupada says like that, Shruti mantras, this means in the Vedas, the Shrutis, right? The Shruti means the Vedas. And particularly, usually what is being referred to will be some statement from the Upanishads. There are many Upanishads, we learned. There's like a, what initially there was 108 Upanishads. They're not all available, but a number of prominent, there's still like eight or more, prominent Upanishads, which are often referred to. And we do quote things like uh, the, the 
Kali Santara Upanishad and, and the oh I, I'm forgetting now the names of all the Upanishads, but there are a number of Upanishads which are quoted and they're all considered Shruti mantras. And the, this Ishopanishad is also it's also Shruti mantras. So they're often quoted and they're evidence to support Vedic reference. And then Prabhupada talks about the word Shukram. Shukram meaning omnipotent. So the Lord is omnipotent. It means he can he can do anything he likes with any of his senses. He has great potency. Prabhupada continues, the Lord's worshipable form, Archa Vigraha, which is installed in temples by authorized Acharyas who have realized the Lord in terms of Mantra 7. Right? We, you remember how the, the devotee is described in Mantra 7? How is the how is the devotee described? They have realized the Lord in terms of mantra seven. How the Lord is non different from the original form of the Lord. All right, in mantra seven we heard about the Madhyam Adhikari and the Uttama Adhikari. How they they see the Lord within everything. And the devotees offer their worship to the form of the Lord in the temple. At the same time, they will they will be merciful to the innocent. They will make friends with the devotees, and they will in, avoid the atheistic and the blasphemers. So, the Lord's original form is that of Sri Krishna. And Sri Krishna expands himself into an un unlimited number of forms. So we were discussing the other day, what is the Lord's original form? So the original form is Lord Sri Krishna. So then we were, what is the original, which form of Krishna is it? Do we worship Krishna as the baby? Or do we worship Krishna in his uh, form as a young man. So in the Gaudiya Mat, we in the Gaudiya mission, we are worshipping the Lord in the threefold bending form, playing the flute as a Nava Yovana, as a eternally youthful cowherd boy. And we see Radha and Krishna together in the form of the deities. And so this is the form of the Lord, the original form of the Lord, meaning the Lord's form in the spiritual world in Goloka Vrindavan. That is the original form of the Lord. Other forms, you can say like Krishna is a baby, then that is worship, that's another sampradaya. And just other sampradaya say will give more importance to the worship of Krishna as a child. Although we were worship, we were also worshiping the Lord. Born in that particular young man. All right. So the original form is mentioned there. Uh, the Lord's original form is that of Sri Krishna, and Sri Krishna expands himself into an unlimited number of forms, such as Baladev, Rama, Narsimha, and Varaha. All of these forms are one and the same personality of Godhead. Similarly, the Archavigraha worshipped in temples 
is also an expanded form of the Lord. By worshipping the Arch of Vigraha, one can at once approach the Lord who accepts the service of a devotee by his omnipotent energy. The Archa Vigraha of the Lord descends at the request of the Acharyas, the holy teachers, and work exactly in the original way of the Lord by virtue of the Lord's omnipotence. Foolish people who have no knowledge of Sri Ishopanishad or any of the other Shruti mantras consider the Archa Vigraha, which is worshipped by pure devotees, to be made of material elements. This form may be seen as material by the imperfect eyes of foolish people or Kanista Adhikaris. But such people do not know that the Lord, being omnipotent and omniscient, can transform matter into the spirit. And so Srila Prabhupada is introducing to us here how the Lord appears, how the Lord descends in his deity form. The Lord has many expansions. Just like the original form we heard is Lord Sri Krishna. And then his first expansion is Lord Balaram. And then from Lord Balaram, then comes uh, Sankarshan and Vasudev, Prajumna, Aniruddha, like this. And then we come to the Purusha avatars and we get from the Purusha avatars, we get the Lord also coming in many of his different Vishnu incarnations, like Rama and Narsingha and Varaha. So all these forms are the same personality of Godhead. And the Lord comes to take part, to perform different pastimes. Sometimes he will come to save the Vedas, just like this Matsya came to save the Vedas. Sometimes he will come to uh, kill the demons, just like Lord Rama came with his bow and killed the different Rakshasas headed by Ravan. And sometimes he comes as the Supreme Lord Krishna. And gives pleasure to his devotees in Vrindavan. We have Lord Varaha picking up the earth from the bottom of the universe. So different leelas are taking place. The Lord's incarnations are there according to the arrangement of the Lord. So the deities are established by the pure devotees. The devotees of the Lord, they will invite the Lord to appear in his deity form and they will arrange for his worship to be performed. So Prabhupada points out how, unfortunately, there are people who are not able to appreciate the importance of the deity worship, that the deity worship sometimes it appears to the to the less advanced devotees. Prabhupada describes them as Kanista Adhikaris here, that they will say, Oh, it's a material form. Foolish people, they do not know that the Lord can appear anywhere. 
and he can appear in matter also. So the form of the deity as an example of how matter can be made into spirit by the grace of the devotees of the Lord. They invite the Lord to appear in the material elements and the Lord will reciprocate with their pure devotion and he will bring life to the deity form. And the, in this way, he will accept the worship of his pure devotees. And at the same time, the Lord can also arrange for spirit to be made into matter. As he desires. Sometimes it happens that the Lord desires that this, uh, what uh, uh, the spirit made into matter, an example would be uh, an example could be like sometimes the a temple may be broken by the demons some some demons may come and they may want to break the temple and they may even break the deity so at that time the lord will leave he will leave the the, the deity although the form of the deity is spiritual the lord can, can again make it into matter and that, that materialistic people think that they're breaking God, that they've killed God. But the Lord himself is a controller of energy. And if he wants, he can make spirit into matter, just as he can make matter into spirit. It's all under his control. We will continue. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord regrets the fallen condition of man with little knowledge who deride him because he descends like a man into this world. Such poorly informed persons do not know the omnipotence of the Lord. Thus the Lord does not manifest himself in full to the mental speculators. He can be appreciated only in proportion to one's surrender to him. The fallen condition of the living entities is due entirely to forgetfulness of their relationship with God. So, Uh, Srila Prabhupada is describing a certain class of people who are not able to understand the presence of the Lord. Although the Lord comes himself, he, co he can come in, in the form as a human being. Prabhupada is pointing out Bhagavad Gita, ninth chapter, how uh, the Lord says, Abhijananti mamudha manushim tanamashrita param bhavam ajananto mamabhuta maheshwaram. The foolish mock at me, descending amongst them like a human being. They do not know my transcendental nature and my supreme dominion over all that be. So the Lord is a re he's, he, he, he comes like an ordinary person, but at the same time, he's performing wonderful pastimes, inconceivable pastimes. And, he's, and he, when he comes, he brings with him his eternal associates, like Nanda and Yashoda, the cowherd boys and the gopis, you know, eternal associates to enjoy his pastimes together. So for ordinary people, 
they confuse they think oh the lord is just an ordinary human being they cannot understand his transcendental nature so lord krishna continues that whatever they try to do in the bhagavad gita the next verse lord krishna said whatever they try to do all their hopes for liberation all their attempts for fruit of activity whatever they endeavor to do they will never be successful so that is the, because they've not accepted lord krishna they have not recognized his transcendental nature and similarly, Prabhupada talks here in this, per, in this paragraph, the fallen condition of a living entity is due entirely to forgetfulness of their relationship with God. So when we forget God, when we take God out of our life, then we enter into a very fallen condition. Our life becomes very inauspicious. So... Those devotees who take the opportunity to surrender themselves to the Lord, then they make their life auspicious. That is the point. In this mantra, as well as in many other Vedic mantras, it is clearly stated that the Lord has been supplying goods to the living entities from time immemorial. A living being desires something and the Lord supplies the object of that desire in proportion to one's qualification. If a man wants to be a high court judge, he must acquire not only the necessary qualification but also the consent of the authority who can award the title of high court judge. The qualification in themselves are insufficient for one to occupy the post. It must be awarded by some superior authority. Similarly, the Lord awards enjoyment to living entities in proportion to their qualification. But good qualifications in themselves are not sufficient to enable one to receive awards. The mercy of the Lord is also required. So this is an important example Prabhupada is giving. And we want to Maras, Maras, your voice is breaking. I have to have to be qualified to read. Amadar Leela, Mother Yashoda was trying to tie up Lord Krishna, and the rope was always two fingers short. And the two fingers, one finger represents the devotee's own serious endeavor and practice. And the other finger represents the mercy of the Lord. So it's not just our own endeavor. We need the Lord's mercy. We want to somehow develop or attract the desire to achieve the mercy of the Lord. We always pray to other, we pray to the Guru, give me mercy. We pray to Srila Prabhupada every day, give mercy. By the mercy of the spiritual master, we get the mercy of Krishna. So we need mercy. We need that mercy. 
And at the same time, we need qualification. It's not just only a mere plea. Like sometimes people think, oh, Jesus died. Jesus died for our sins so we can go on doing what we like. And Jesus is there to deliver us. It, so it's not only just mercy. We must also have qualification. But even having the best qualifications is not enough. We need also mercy. So very important points are being made here in this purport. Ordinarily, the living being does not know Unfortunately, Hare Krishna Maharaj, is that you? 9894314888 because that's muted. Hare Krishna, maybe the host can help to unmute Maharaj. I mean to unmute Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. No, we can hear you. What's going on? Maybe huh? your, your internet Who connection. Me? Who muted me? Nobody muted you. Maybe you read. Your voice was breaking. Maybe internet connection problem from your side. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay, we'll continue. I don't know. I mean, 
I didn't. Nobody told me you couldn't. You couldn't hear me. Nobody told me the voice was breaking. Maharaj, actually, we were saying you, but you cannot hear us. That's why I can't hear you. Let's... That's it. That's the problem. You know, I can't hear you. Even now, your voice is not clear. Oh. What to do? Anyway, we'll keep trying. Huh. Yes. Now your voice is clear. I mean, we all huh? can hear you. Now your voice is clear. You can continue. Now my voice is not clear? Clear, clear. Clear, clear, clear Maharaj. Please clear. continue. It's clear, Maharaj. You can continue. It's clear. Okay. So look, if my voice breaks again, you have to put a message on the screen to let me know. Because I'm not hearing you very well, somehow. All right, so we're explaining here about the Lord, how uh, Prabhupada is talking about the devotee must be very focused in his desire. Those who are on this path are resolute in determination, and their aim is one. O oh, beloved child of the Kurus, the intelligence of those who are irresolute is many branched. So, if we're not focused on Krishna, if we're not clear about the goal, what is our real aim of life? In that category. Example, material life is chewing the chewed. So we don't want to get involved in that business again, chewing what is already being chewed. We want to understand the real focus of the goal of life is to develop love for the Lord. We want to develop the relationship with the Lord. That should be clearly understood. And th then the Lord will reciprocate. You want to get the mercy of the Lord? You have to show that you want the mercy. We have to let the Lord know by our devotional activities. As Prabhupada said, if, if, if somebody wants to go to hell, then Krishna can easily arrange for, for them. And if somebody wants to go back to him, then the Lord will also help him. He will help us. If we want to go back, he will help make arrangements. He will send devotees. He will send association. He will send uh, different... He, he will arrange different signs to help us on this path back home. When we eagerly, when we're very determined, and very sincere and committed to his service, then Krishna will certainly help. And we have, of course, many wonderful examples in the Krishna consciousness movement, how Krishna helped the devotees. So God is described here as Paribu, the greatest of all. No one is greater than or equal to him. Other living beings are described here as beggars who ask goods from the Lord. The Lord supplies the things the living entities desire. If the entities, if the entities were equal to the Lord in potency, if they were omnipotent and omniscient, there would be no question of their being, of their begging from the Lord, even for so-called liberation. Real liberation means going back to Godhead. Liberation is conceived by, of, by an impersonalist as is a myth. And begging for sense gratification has to continue eternally unless the beggar comes to his spiritual senses and realizes 
his constitutional position. So let's look at this. The Lord is described as Paribu, the greatest of all. Nobody is equal to him. So Prabhupada argues that he, he is omnipotent, he is omniscient, we are not. We don't know everything and we don't have great potencies. We, we, we therefore are engaged in begging. We're like beggars. And people go to the Lord begging. But, of course, they don't know what to ask from the Lord. They may pray to the Lord, but they don't know what to ask for. They will simply ask for material benefits. Oh, give me food. Oh, give me shelter. Oh, give me long life. Oh, protect me from disease. We will ask so many material things. And sometimes people will even ask for liberation. Just like sometimes these people, the impersonalists, they, will, they want to get liberation. But their liberation is only a theoretical liberation. It is not factual liberation. Because they may, the, the impersonalists, they enter into the Brahma Jyoti. At the very best, they enter into the Brahma Jyoti. She's permanently situated simply in the void, and they again return to the material world. And similarly, other people, they may be begging for their maintenance and for their protection, for their sense gratification. That is an endless business of begging. They'll never, they'll never stop. The material desires will never be satis never be satisfied. And so we have to understand that until one actually realizes his spiritual position in relationship to the Lord, there will be no end to his material desires. The begging business will continue. Life after life. That's the nature of material existence. So people are begging. But the real business of life is not simply begging, but we should appreciate what is given to us by the grace of the Lord. Everything is actually provided by the grace of the Lord. We don't need to ask him for anything. We just have to be satisfied with what he gives us. And those who are pure devotees, they won't ask the Lord for anything except devotional service. Just give me devotional service, birth after birth. That is the mood of the devotee. Please just keep me engaged in your service. Prabhupada continues, only the Supreme Lord is self-sufficient. When Lord Krishna appeared on earth 5,000 years ago, he displayed his full manifestation as the personality of Godhead through his various activities. In his childhood, he killed many powerful demons, such as Aga Sura. Baka Sura and Sakata Sura, and there was no question of his having acquired such power through any extraneous endeavor. He lifted Govardhan Hill 
without ever practicing weightlifting. He danced with the gopis without social restriction and without reproach. Although the gopis approached him with a paramour's feeling of love, the relationship between the gopis and Lord Krishna was worshipped even by Lord Chaitanya, who was a strict sannyasi, and rigid follower of the disciplinary regulations. In confirmation that, or to confirm that the Lord is always pure and con uncontaminated, Sri Ishopanishad describes him as Shudam, meaning antiseptic, and Hello? Hello? Hare Krishna Maharaj, now can listen? Huh? Now you can hear me? It's so, uh, just now, uh, the sound not appearing, no, can't listen anything, now come back again. Now? Now what? Now can listen. Now, can, now can listen, Maharaj. We can hear you now, Maharaj. You can hear me now. I think we lost connection for a while just now. Yeah, I lost connection. I saw. Yeah, we had. To, I had to reconnect. Okay, I can hear you now. I can hear you all now. So that's something good. So maybe we have a better connection now. All right, so we're, anyway, we're explaining here 
this important point about these two words, uh, about the nature of the Lord, how the Lord, first of all, are you hearing okay? Yeah? Yes. Yes. yes, 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 yes okay. Okay, we're on this last paragraph here of this purport of this mantra eight. And we're hearing about the Lord's self-sufficiency, that he, how he, Maharaj, again, the... Man, and then Prabhupada brings up... Huh? Hello? Oh, this is breaking again, no? Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're, we're talking about the Lord's pastimes and Prabhupada brought up about how he could pick up the Govardhan Hill and he didn't have to practice weight lifting. He didn't have to build muscles in order to pick up the Govardhan Hill. He could do it all by his spiritual power. And then he talks about also he danced with the gopis without social restriction and without reproach. So this point is often misunderstood that the Lord's dancing with the gopis, people, some, they will consider them to be an expression of mundane love, material love. They don't understand that this is uh, the pastime of the Lord which is coming from the spiritual world from the highest platform of the spiritual world and it's an expression of the pure love between the Lord and his devotees and there's no question of mundane love but people who are unqualified they try to understand the highest thing. It's on the highest level, but people who are on the lowest level try to understand something on the highest level. And naturally, they become lost, they become confused by it. So the relationship between the Lord and his devotees is pure. And Prabhupada points out how Lord Chaitanya was a strict sannyasi. And similarly, Sukadeva Goswami was a completely renounced avaduta detached from all material sense gratification. But they all considered the pastime of Lord Krishna and dancing with the gopis to be completely pure and without any... Uh, contamination of the material world and then Prabhupada's purport goes on to talk about this shudam and appa vidam shudam meaning antiseptic and appa vidam prophylactic so these two words have to be understood they're also uh, used to describe the pastimes of the Lord and the power of the devotee. Uh, so antiseptic, you know, we have, have some infection, we'll put some antiseptic on it, right? That will protect us, protect it from any disease. So similarly, the Lord, the Lord is antiseptic. He can protect us from any contempt. And he is also prophylactic. So this is prophylactic in the sense that 
sin cannot touch him. The Lord can do whatever he likes. He's not under the laws of the material nature. So he's not required to act according to the material standards. When he comes to this material platform, he's presenting to us the pastimes of the spiritual world. And they're being shown to us but we have to understand them we have to appreciate that these are not pastimes just simply for us to imitate but the lord is giving us a vision of the spiritual world and he wants to attract us to go back to him in the spiritual world that's why the lord descends and performs his pastimes one is to give pleasure to his devotees, and at the same time, he's also attracting us, that we will want to go and join with him and be with him. So the Lord is apavidam, that sin does not touch him. For us, if we do something like that, then it would be wrong. Of course, we will be sinful. But when the Lord does it, there's no question of sin. The Lord is not sinful. He can never be sinful because he himself is the controller. He is the supreme Lord. So when he does something, he does it. He's doing it by his own desire, by his own arrangement. There's no question of any sin. So this, these are the meaning of these two words, right? Shudam and Apapavidam. Apapa Shudam, antiseptic. Just like during the COVID time, we were all very careful. We were using antiseptic hand wash. We wanted to protect everything. Everything was antiseptic. So the Lord is antiseptic. Yeah. Uh, the, the Lord purifies everything. Just by chanting the holy name and by having the Lord, invoking the Lord's presence, then everything becomes purified. And the example is given also about the sun, how the sun comes on the untouchable places. Just like in India, every morning, you know, people go out into the fields or into the, the, the roads somewhere even, and they will simply meet the calls of nature. And the, every day the sun will come and purify these places. So the rays of the sun, they purify even untouchable places. The sun never gets affected by absorbing the impure uh, rays from the untouchable places. Rather, the sun purifies the, the dirty places. So in the same way, the Lord also comes and he purifies everything by his presence. Everything is purified. So are there some questions on this mantra, number eight? Anybody has any questions? Yeah?
Well, he desires for our welfare. And he's always thinking about us, how to bring us back to Godhead. So he has that desire. He's complete in himself, but at the same time, still, he's, he's not uh, unaware of our own plight, that we're loitering in the material world, and we're trying to enjoy independently of him. So he desires to bring us out of our ignorance and to bring us back to our constitutional position. The example is given just like a rich father may have a son and the wayward son may leave the father, he may go off and leave the father, simply takes some money from the father and goes off on his own and, you know, his life ends up a failure. He loses everything and, and you know, the, his wife leaves him and he's no money and he's loitering in the street. But the, the man's father is a rich man. So the rich man, the father, he's thinking about his son. He wants to bring his son back home. But the son is still just loitering in the streets, just in the life of ignorance, and completely miserable and ignorant. And the father is always thinking how to bring the son back. So the same way the Lord is like the well-wishing father. And his desire is to help all of us to come out of our ignorance, to go back to him. And that's why he performs the work of creation. And that's why the Lord comes himself into the material world. And he will speak the Bhagavad Gita. And he will send his pure devotees just to preach to all of us to set up the missionary activities and try to lead us out of our ignorance. Yeah? Do you understand the desire of the Lord? Okay. Oh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, can you hear me? Yes, Prabhu. Yeah, Maharaj Hare Krishna, I have a question. You mentioned uh, that the three Isupanishads do not mention a particular name of God. And then, uh, in general, uh, many times in the Vedas, it is mentioned as Bhagavan, sometimes Vishnu, sometimes even Surya. I don't know about Lord Brahma sometimes, but not clearly. I don't know, maybe some Vedas is mentioned about Lord Krishna. I just wondering why in the, in the Vedas, uh, in many of the Vedas, doesn't mention clearly that Lord Krishna is the supreme personality of God. I don't know about the Brahma Samhita, whether it's part of the Vedas. Maybe you can please uh, 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 tell us something about this. Can you hear us? Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Somebody muted me again. How did that happen? I think somebody somebody started recording again, and that's when it happened. Who did that? Well, I could hear somebody say you being recorded. 
Parash, when when you you listen that there is uh that is there's a, a recording going on, that means you went off the line and you came back online. So that's why you're hearing that the recording is being recorded. So automatically you'll be muted. So you have to unmute yourself, Maharaj. Because the host mm. has put it such a way that you will they are automatically muted when they enter the Zoom session. Okay. All right, you can hear me now. Okay. Yes, yes, Maharaj. yes. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, very well, Maharaj. All right, so we're talking about the, this name, Marichi Prabhu's question, why, why the name is not mentioned there, why that there's no so much in, in, indication about the... But, but we have to understand the function of the Vedas. The function of the Vedas is not so much to give pure devotional service, but the Vedas are described in the Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna describes the Vedas as Trigunya Vishaya Veda, that the Vedas deal with the subject matter of the three modes of material nature. So the Vedas are describing how people can lead a life in the material world and how they can enjoy economic development and sense gratification and ultimately go on to liberation. So the Vedas, like the, we talk about the Purusha Artas, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. That's what's in the Vedas, dealing with material religiosity. So a lot of rituals are described in the Vedas. Material religion, rituals, performing rituals for sense gratification. This is quite common in the Vedic literature. A lot of information on that. And from by practicing material religiosity, then they will get economic development, and economic development will lead to sense gratification, and then people are expected to think about liberation. Of course, it usually happens that people never go any; they never think about liberation. They only think about economic development and sense gratification. That's what they want. People, they, they never think about liberation. And material religiosity is also forgotten because they're so busy trying to get economic development and then sense gratification. But that's what the Vedas are dealing with. And you want to get pure devotion, you have to go somewhere else. The Vedas are not meant for giving pure devotion. A Lord Brahma describes in the Brahma Samhita that um, very difficult to know the Lord from the Vedas, but very easy to know from the devotee. So we're encouraged uh, to, you know, but that we, we don't spend much time studying the Vedas because there's not a lot really there for us. There are some references however and like this Ishopanishad, this is from the Vedas so this is one of the references but you can see in the Sri Ishopanishad everything is vague it's not there's no clear indications about who is the Lord and what we're supposed to do but we're given we are there are some indications but it's it's more in a covered manner So everything has to be understood very carefully. And uh, we see particularly like this mantra, so many things are, you know, it, it could be easily misunderstood that the Lord is described as unembodied, without veins. Oh, so, so many things people would be, would be completely bewildered by. So the, the Upanishads are like that. You have to be guided. The Vedas, also the Vedas, the, the four Vedas, they had to be taught by Brahmanas. People have to be Brahmanas to, to know the Only the Brahmanas are allowed to recite the Vedas. So you have to hear them from the Brahmanas. And means people who are 
and fully in the mode of goodness, who are pure Brahma. And, but Brahmana, again, just simply means the mode of goodness. They're not necessarily devotees. You've got different kinds of Brahmanas. You've got Brahmana Pandits and Brahmana Vaishnavas. Not every Brahmana is a Brahmana Vaishnava. Other Brahmanas, they may be Pandits. So this is the problem, trying to hear from the Pandits. We get confused. So you want to understand the Lord properly, we have to go to the Bhakti Shastras. We have to hear from Srimad Bhagavatam, the fruit of the Vedas. So Srila Vyasadeva compiled Srimad Bhagavatam, the fruit of the Vedas, to help us understand clearly who is the Supreme Lord. Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam. Srila Vyasadeva has given us everything there in Srimad Bhagavatam, establishing the clear position of the Lord. But if you just simply depend on the Vedic knowledge, then you, you won't get much understanding. All right? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Any other question there? That's, these were good questions, didn't I? Yes, brother. Uh, the Lord's various forms, like I mean, uh, Rama, Balare, Narsima, and also Akra Vigraha, they are all the same, is mentioned. But what about the home? It, at, in the home altar, we have only the picture. Picture of him, is it okay? Yes, it's okay. The Lord can also appear in pictures. Okay. The form of the deity can be made from different things, right? It mm -hmm. can be wood, it can be stone, it can be jewels, it can be paint, it can even be in the mind. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. Everything depends on the attitude of the worshipper. You see, so it's your own attitude, your own devotion. If, you, if you're if you actually feeling the presence of the Lord there and seeing the Lord present there in that picture, then very nice. Yeah. yeah. It's not different from the from a, a, from a, a stone deity or a wooden deity or whatever. Yeah, I understand. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other question? Okay. So we still have some time. We'll go ahead to mantra number nine. Uh, we won't. We, the, the next mantra, nine, ten, and eleven are dealing with the topic of knowledge or vidya and avidya, right? We're going to hear in these three, three verses about vidya and avidya. Uh, so mantra number nine. Andantamaha pravishanti Ye vidyam upasate, tatabu ya ivate tamo, ya o vidyayam rataha. Those who engage in the culture of nations' activities shall enter into the darkest region of ignorance. Worse still are those engaged in the culture of so called knowledge. So again, you can see the nature of these Ishopanishads, how they describe things that uh, it's quite, can be quite bewildering. So, culture of nation activities, in other words, the culture of material activities, 
enter into the darkest region of ignorance. But then worse still are those who engage in the culture of so-called knowledge. So this culture of so-called knowledge is being very much Comparative study of Vidya and Avidya. Uh -huh. Avidya or ignorance is undoubtedly dangerous. But Vidya or knowledge is even more dangerous when mistaken, when mistaken or misguided. The mantra of Sri Ishopanishad is more applicable today than at any time in the past. Modern civilization has advanced considerably in the field of mass education, but the result is that people are more unhappy than ever before because of the stress placed on material advancement to the exclusion of the most of life, the spiritual aspect. So this is, you can see, this is a very important point here. We often argue about this point to people when they're presenting Krishna consciousness, that people simply they only care about their material life. They're only thinking about their material education. And they don't take any time to get any spiritual education. So they're so much concerned with improving their standard of living, but they neglect the most important part of life. Therefore, see a spiritual part of, part of life. Prabhupada continues, as far as Vidya is concerned, the first mantra has explained very clearly that the Supreme Lord is the proprietor of everything. And that forgetfulness of this fact is more, is so this fact is ignorant. The more a man forgets the darkness, you will a godless civilization directed towards the so-called advancement of education is more dangerous than a civilization in which the mass of people are less educated. So this is a very heavy statement Prabhupada is making. He is explaining how modern civilization are simply ruining the life of people today because people are so much eager for sense gratification so they're so forgetful they're so forgetful about the fact that everything belongs to god and they just simply want to to, to get education they, they go for education but they don't know how to make use of their knowledge. So that, that is a serious problem. That if people are uneducated, they won't do any harm. But when you educate people in the wrong way, we simply give them material knowledge and we don't give them the proper uh, 
education on how to use that knowledge, then it creates, it's, that's the biggest danger. So this is a problem which is being made. This is the point which is being made here. That it's very dangerous to educate people without educating them in God consciousness. And we see Dronacharya, Dronacharya didn't want to educate Ekalavya. He wouldn't accept Ekalavya as a student. They don't acknowledge it's trying to make a Can you hear me? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Your voice is breaking, Maharaj. And yogis, the kamis, are those who have it of sense fresh. I don't know. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. Your voice, you yes, we can hear you, but your voice does break here and there. Oh, okay. So will, will I continue or what? And let's continue. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. okay. All right, so... I'm reading Prabhupada's purport here, this mantra number nine. Of the different classes of men, karmis, jnanis, and yogis, the karmis are those who are engaged in the activities of sense gratification. In the modern civilization, 99.9% .9 of the people are engaged in the activities of sense gratification under the under the flags of industrialism economic development altruism political activism and so on all these activities are more or less based on satisfaction of the senses to the exclusion of the kind of God consciousness described in the Shruti mantra, or described in the first mantra. So again, reference is made to the first mantra, that the Lord is the proprietor, that we should respect everything as the property of God and simply accept our quota. So, nobody's thinking like that. Everybody is thinking, I want to become the proprietor. So, the karmis are like that. This is the mood of the karmi, that he's wanting, he's trying to enjoy the material world. Prabhupada continues, in the language of the Bhagavad Gita, People who are engaged in sense gratification are mudhats, asses. The ass is a symbol of stupidity. 
those who simply engage in the pure in the profitless pursuit of sense gratification are worshipping avidya according to Sri Ishopanishad. Right? They're worship they're actually worshipping avidya. Hmm? Those who are engaged in what the verse said, let's read the verse again. Uh -huh. Those who are engaged in the culture of nascent activities. So, andan tamaha pravishanti ye vidyam upasyate. So, they are worshipping avidya. And the result of the worship of avidya, well, they're simply, they're, they're, they're entering into the darkest region of ignorance. But those who play the role of helping this sort of civilization in the name of educational advancement are actually doing more harm than doing good to those who are on the platform of gross sense gratification. The advancement of learning by a godless people is as dangerous as a valuable jewel on the head of a cobra. A cobra decorated with a valuable jewel is more dangerous than one not decorated. It's a beautiful example. The example of the cobra. Of course, if there's a cobra, ooh, you know, we'll just run away. We don't want to be around cobras. You know, they they bite then the, the bite of the cobra can kill people. So it's a painful death to be bitten by a cobra. Uh, but if there's a jewel on the head of the cobra, when the cobra has a jewel, some snakes actually have these jewels on their head. There are some snakes. They, in the history of the world, they've found these kind of snakes. And they're described also in the Vedic literature. Some snakes have jewels on their head. And so when you, if it's a snake with a jewel on its head, then it becomes, we're, we're more interested. It's attractive, you know. We think maybe I can get that jewel. Maybe somehow I can get the jewel from the head of the snake. And so it becomes very dangerous because you can be bitten. So in the same way, Hari Bhakti Sudodaya, the advancement of education by godless people is compared to decoration of a dead body. Advancement of learning in a godless people is as dangerous as a jewel on the head of a cobra. So what this one example is given first the cobra the jewel in the head of a cobra comparing the, the the advancement of learning in a godless people that it's as dangerous as the jewel in the head of a cobra and then the next example the advancement uh, of a uh, uh, advancement of education by godless people is compared to decoration of a dead body. In India, as in many other countries, some people follow the custom of leading a procession who decorate a dead body for the pleasure of the lamenting relatives. In the same way, modern civilization is a patchwork of activities meant to cover the perpetual miseries of material existence. So decorating a dead body, what is the point? It's, it's so useless. But some people, they will do this. Oh, decorate, paint, decorate the body nicely. Put put their makeup on nicely. This way they feel happy. 
to see the dead person decorated with their jewelry. So, all such activities are aimed towards sense gratification. But above the senses is the mind, and above the mind is the intelligence, and above the intelligence is the soul. Thus, the aim of real education should be self-realization, realization of the spiritual values of the soul. Any education which does not lead to such realization must be considered avidya or nations. And to culture such nations means to go down to the darkest region of ignorance. All right, so two very important examples in that paragraph we should remember those and then proper the real aim of education what is real knowledge self-realization knowledge of the soul there's a hierarchy and proper pointed out the higher bhagavad gita also describes the senses are superior to dull matter Mind is higher than the senses. Intelligence is higher than the mind. And he, the soul, is higher still. So the real goal of self-realization is to come to that spiritual platform. Not to just become lost in the culture of material knowledge. Continuing, according to Bhagavad Gita, mistaken mundane ed educators are known as Veda Vada Rata and Maya Aparita Jnana. So these terms are very important. These are the kind of things you have to learn, which definitely they'll come up when we have the closed book test or something. They'll ask you, you know, what are give some examples of mistaken mundane educators so the two terms are there veda vada rata and maya aparita jnana or you may be asked to explain these terms uh veda vada rata and they're both from bhagavad gita veda vada rata mean Prophecy, simply mouthing the words of the Vedas, simply repeating the words of the Vedas without the understanding behind the Vedas. And Maya Aparita Jnana means those whose knowledge is stolen by illusion. All right, so they may also be atheistic persons or atheistic demons. The lowest of men those who are veda vada rata pose themselves as very learned in the vedic literature but unfortunately they're completely diverted from the purpose of the vedas in the bhagavad gita it is said that the purpose of the vedas is to know the personality of godhead but these veda vada Ratas, men, are not at all interested in the personality of Godhead. On the contrary, they are fascinated by such fruit of results as the maintenance, as the attainment of heaven. All right, so the Veda Vada Rata is described that they're eager to go to heaven, to enjoy it. <laughs> the opulence of the heavenly planets. And they're not interested in the personality of Godhead at all. As stated in Mantra 1, we should know that the personality of Godhead is the proprietor of everything and that we must be satisfied with our allotted portions of the necessities of life. The purpose of the Vedic literature is to 
awaken the God consciousness in the forgetful living being. And the same and the same purpose is presented in various ways in the different scriptures of the world for the understanding of all foolish mankind. Thus, the ultimate purpose of all religion is to bring one back to Godhead. But the Vedavada Rata, all the Vedavada Rata people, instead of realizing that the purpose of the Vedas is to revive the forgetful soul's last lost relationship with the personality of Godhead, take it for grant, granted that such side issues as the attainment of heavenly pleasure for sense gratification is the lust for which is the lust for which is the lust for which cause is the lust for which causes their material bondage in the first place are the ultimate end of the Vedas. Such people misguide others by misinterpreting the Vedic literature. Sometimes they even condemn the Puranas, which are Vedic explanations for laymen. The Vedavada Rata gives their own explanation of the Vedas, neglecting the authority of great teachers. They also tend to raise from themselves present him No. What is breaking again, Maharaj? Okay, we're nearly finished. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can, but yes, Maharaj. I'm just I'm just going through this purport. We're just nearly finished. So such Vedavada Ratyas are especially condemned by this mantra by the very appropriate word Vidya Yam Rata. Vidya Yam refers to the study of the Vedas because the Vedas are the origin of all knowledge. Vidya. And Rata means those engaged. So Vidya Yam Rata. Thus means those engaged in the study of the Vedas. The so-called students of the Vedas are condemned therein because they are ignorant of the actual purpose of the Vedas on account of their disobeying the Acharyas. Such Vedavada Ratas search out meanings in every word of the Vedas to suit their own purposes. They do not know that the Vedic literature is a collection of extraordinary books that can be understood only through the chain of disciplic succession. <coughs> so, Srila Prabhupada, can you hear me? It's Maharaj, yes. So, Srila Prabhupada is elaborately explaining the nature of the Vedavada Rata and how they give their own meaning to the Vedic literature to suit their own purposes. 
What are their purposes? Their purpose, they think about enjoying the heavenly planets. And to that means they can interpret every word and give their own uh, interpretation, speculation, in other words. So, in this way, the Vedavada Raka is explained. One must approach a bona fide spiritual master in order to understand the transcendental message of the Vedas. That is the direction of Mandaka Upanishad. These Vedavada people, however, have their own succession. They are their progress into the darkest region of ignorance by, by misinterpreting the Vedic literature. They fail even for, they fall even further into ignorance than those who have no knowledge of the Vedas at all. They fall even further into ignorance than those who have no knowledge of the Vedas at all. So they're completely off track. And it's, uh, it's offensive on their part to misinterpret the words of the Vedas, to give their own meanings, to misinterpret the Vedic literature, they become offensive. And the result is they get a very bad result. So in this way, we're warned about the danger of the Vedavada Rata. And then finally, the other class of the, the other class of mistaken mundane egg educator, the Maya Aparita Gyana is described. The, the Maya Aparita Gyana class We lost Maharaj, I think. We don't see him. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, Maharaj. I can hear yes, you. Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. So, the, these foolish people, they claim that they're God, but they cannot answer how is it God became caught in Maya? How is it you became illusioned and now you've become God? 
And so it mean that it would mean that Maya was more powerful than God. But they, at the same time, they claim that God is all powerful. So how is it that He is all powerful? They cannot give these kind. They cannot answer these kind of questions. So we want to understand everything carefully with the help of the scriptures. This is important here, the um, important points to remember. These are examples which Prabhupada gave, decoration of the dead body, the jewel on the head of the cobra, and then the two kinds of mistaken mundane educators, Maya Aparita Jnana, and Veda Vada Rata. All right, we should remember these kind of things. All right, any questions? Material knowledge is all avidya. If there's no concept of God consciousness, then it's avidya. Yes. We can say, if there's no concept of God consciousness, then it is simply avidya. Well, you have to balance the two. You have to, that will be pointed out in a couple of mantras. It will be explained how one has to cultivate both vidya and avidya side by side. So you'll come, we'll come to that in the, maybe in the next class. But mantra number, uh, mantra 11 will describe that one has to cultivate both vidya and avidya side by side. You know? So we have we have to understand the nature of avidya. We have to, we have to know, just like we have to read, right? You can't say that. Oh, reading is avidya. Well, if you read Krishna conscious, if you read a Krishna conscious book, it's not my. You know, somebody wants to get education. He can do it in Krishna consciousness. That's all. That's all transcendental knowledge. It's all vidya. But if you learn to read and you learn everything and you never never learn anything about topics of the Lord, and you never learn any spiritual knowledge, then it's simply avidya. You may be PhD. PhD. Prabhupada said, "Plow department." You are M.A., M.A., Master of Avidya. Right? And so we don't give very much importance to these kind of designations in the spiritual sense. They're not important. They're material designations. Any other question? Anybody else? Any question? Okay, then we'll stop here tonight. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Recording stopped. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj.